Hey everyone, welcome to Your Virtual Coffee, the web show which introduces you to great local businesses in the Denver metro area. Today, my guest is Joyce Foistel, owner of Boomer Social Media Tutor. She offers LinkedIn individual and group trainings and gives LinkedIn presentations in a variety of settings, both virtually and face-to-face. -face. Examples include workshops, webinars to corporate and small business teams, presentations to membership organizations, and training for those job seekers out there. So with that, Joyce, welcome to my show. So excited to be here with you. Thanks for asking me. You're so welcome. I've been actually really looking forward to this because you and I have been friends for a while. Yeah. And I have, because I come from an IT background, I kind of have such an affinity for what you offer both people and businesses. But I would like our audience to kind of get to know you a little bit. From your biography, you list reading as one of your hobbies. Do you have a favorite literary genre? Well, depends when you ask me about that. At Christmas time, I could be reading a really good fiction book. Uh, I, I really like historical fiction. Um, I also like books like um, A Team of Rivals. I like to read about the presidency and, you know, so people who've been well known and kind of their background and how they tick, that type of thing. I mean, that took me months, I swear, to read it. More recently, and in general, I read more, uh, I'll just bring up a, a book here um, by Tara Moore, Playing Big. I would say personal development slash um, professional development kinds of books. I'm actually in a book read that's reading this book two chapters at a time every month. <laughs> that's perfect for me because to read a whole book in a month, I mean, it's just sad to say I couldn't do that, but that's very manageable. So I, I like books uh, like that. I recently got a book called uh, The Serendipity Mindset, which I'm excited about reading that. So it's a lot of people recommend books to me and then I'll get them on Amazon and off I go. I agree with it. I kind of go in spurts as far as what I like to read. One of them, well, always Malcolm Gladwell. I've read wow. everything he's written. Um, I find a lot of business applications in his books, believe it or not. And I tend to enjoy them more than some of the business books out there. Um, but I also go through classics phase, whether it's um, the Count of Monte Cristo, which is probably my favorite book. Do you have, do yeah. you get into any of the classics or? Oh, I haven't lately. I was thinking about Anna Green Gables for some reason comes to mind because my daughter is, my daughter will read it on FaceTime to our five-year-old granddaughter. I know you would relate to this. So she'll read little sections of it. And it's so endearing to hear my daughter reading to her little niece. So yeah, I don't know. I, I have, um, you know, that's, that's probably somehow a book that just comes right to mind. Well, I well, think she's so spunky. I mean, I think Anna Green Gables really um, is a, though her character was set in the early 1900s, is really someone for us all to look to in terms of spunky almost underestimates her, her strong-willed nature and the direction she wanted to go and how she you know, adapted to her times, but really knew herself, you know, fascinating young woman. I love that. Now, I just finished watching the miniseries Brave New World, and I'm going to have to go back and read the book because there were some things in there I don't quite remember, and I kind of like to know what was added for the show versus yeah. um, what was actually in the book, um, but it's quite I good, know. and I do recommend it. Now, you originally started in another career path. Would you share about that? Well, there's several, actually. I'm going to touch briefly on the fact that, you know, I'm born in 1948, you know, and I'm, I'm proud to say that is maybe one word. A lot of people would say, oh, don't say, share your age. So let me put my life in a context. Girls who were born in 1948 and then came of age, graduating high school in the 60s, we will say girls in the 50s too, born in the 50s. What kind of career paths were really common? Well, teaching, nursing, well, secretary, you know, working in retail, family business, things like that. 
you know, especially a small town where I'm from in Wisconsin. Well, my mom was a teacher, my grandpa was a teacher, you know, there was a lot. So I figured I'd be a teacher. So I tried teaching, but I'm too much of a free spirit. I, I don't do well with rules and structure and bells and also kind of being in the same place, talking to the same people every day. So then I tried some other things like nonprofit and that didn't turn out. I was a home mom all through the 80s and into the 90s. So the longest career I had was in sales. And that I fell into when shortly after we moved to Colorado from Wisconsin in 1995. And there I worked for the Chamber of Commerce. I worked for the Better Business Bureau, all outside sales. And then I morphed over into education sales to the University of Phoenix. So there you're an enrollment advisor, AKA inside sales really, functionally. And then my last uh, job was with the College for Financial Planning which is a very niche educational institution that provides professional development courses to people who are either already financial planners needing CE, like, you know, like your husband needs his lawyer CE, so do those financial planners need theirs, or people wanting to get into the field. So these are various types of courses they need to take like a certified financial planner exam or get master's courses even. So that was all inside sales. So that's what I did until 2013. Now, do you do, well, I actually already know the answer to this question. <laughs> Where do you go into your extensive networking background? And what do you find that professionals struggle with about networking? Well, networking is, I think, a leap of faith, sort of, even for an extrovert like me, it's, I think, a, you got to think where, with whom should I be networking? And there's so many options. I mean, back in the 90s, when I worked for the Chamber of Commerce out here in Lakewood, the West Metro Chamber, I mean, there weren't all these different niched groups that are out there now. So you would just go to your local Chamber of Commerce, like, you know, I met you through the Denver Chamber, and it was pretty straightforward. Now, and especially, you know, just with Meetup and everything, there's just so many different options. So you think, oh, gee whiz, how do I decide? So you, you need to go around, I think, and see what other people are doing, you know, visit different groups, see what works for you. And <clears throat> so that's the first part. Then the next part is think about, like, do you like co-ed versus all women? There's a lot of people I know that are women that prefer to network strictly with other women because their main clientele are women. So they think, well, that's who I really I want to hang out with. No, me, I'm a more of a co-ed girl. I mean, I've been part of the Women's Chamber of Commerce for many years. I would call that group women-centric but men-friendly so that you do have a sprinkling of men there. And it doesn't have quite that rah, rah, go girls feel that some other groups have, which for me, I'm just not, it doesn't suit my style, I guess, for lack of a better word. So there's all that and you got to look at your budget. And really, most importantly, you have to look at your time. You know, my, you know, how much time can you devote to networking? Am I my morning person? Am I lunch hour? Does late afternoon work for me? I mean, so there's so many considerations. So then once you are out networking, then you think, oh, how do I talk to these people? How do I engage with them? You know, whether it's virtually because you have meetings on Zoom, you have, or other video conferencing site, you have face-to-face -face meetings. How do I approach people? So I think sometimes say if you're an introvert, Maybe you don't feel comfortable like walking right up to them very boldly, but you get their business card and you send them an email, maybe send them a LinkedIn invite. So I think you have to really assess your comfort level in these different kinds of activities and, and not feel like you have to go talk to someone right after a meeting. Um, so, the, I mean, those are just some thoughts I have about it. But I think so much of it is finding groups where you feel like this is your tribe. These are people you want to hear what they share, you know, a week in and week out, or, or maybe they meet twice a month, things like that. So it just, I think there's just a lot of factors. I would talk to people who've been out there networking world for a while and just pick their brain a little bit about it too. Yeah, I deal with introverts from time to time, especially at networking events. And my feeling is I like to tell them, um, you don't have to meet everyone in the room. You know, just keep a goal small. I'm going to talk to three people and then I can go and do that yeah. and do the follow up like you were talking about where mm -hmm. you connect with them on LinkedIn, 
things like that. I'd like so to just do a little PS to that. Sure. You know that that introverts, of course, like my husband is one, are the best listeners you'll ever meet. And uh, the, the top producer in my last sales job was an introvert. She was amazing, incredibly perceptive person. So I think you build on your strengths. Um, and there's a great book called Quiet. Woman yes. is trained as a lawyer, right? Every introvert should read that because we're wired as this extroverted world. And even when you said deal with introverts, I thought, oh, Gina, that sounds kind of harsh, you know, but, uh, but you were meeting in a loving way. Yes. Because as an extrovert, sometimes you can get impatient with the introvert. But I think that there's so many attributes they bring. And by just, like you said, just zeroing in on a handful of people and playing to their strengths and really listening to them, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's through something like this or whether in person, they're, they're amazing. And I mean, also, and, you know, asking those open-ended questions yeah. to people, I think, um, tends to get that introvert to open up a little bit because, you know, that can be overwhelming oh, for yeah. the, you know, networking events can be loud, they can be crowded, and it can, I definitely understand how it can be um, overwhelming. And so I feel my job as an extrovert is to kind of minimize that for those introverts out there, because I do have, like you said, I do have a, a heart for them. I'm married to one as, as well as you are. What is an issue that keeps your client up at night and how do you address it? Well, I think one thing that especially the 60 and up crowd worry about, but maybe everybody does is, did I say something stupid on social media? How do I get rid of it? What if someone sees that? I have a client right now who has a particular political point of view and he made a comment of, um, on, on a post made by somebody else on LinkedIn um, that reflected his political point of view. Probably not the smartest move he realizes now. And he thinks in the somewhat comment back like, oh really, you know? You think you were on Facebook in some kind of pissing match to be a little blunt here. But um, at any rate, so I think people worry about, about that, but also I think they worry about privacy. We were talking about that before the show a bit in terms of documents, storage, and things like that in your law firm. So I think that they're, they're concerned about whether people can get into their social media, so the hacking feeling. So I think that it's, I think those are some of the things that concern them. And then also, I think, I don't know, see, keep them up is kind of a strong phrase, but things that uh, frustrate them is when other people around them seem to know what's going on and how to use a particular site like LinkedIn, and they just feel like lost. They don't know what they're talking about. I had a guy from New Jersey, no, it was Virginia, I think, anyway, out east, who found me, I believe, it just it was through LinkedIn. And he was at that time, maybe 60, early 60s, and he just felt just left behind by his younger colleagues. This is a media buying firm. And um, he was so good, it was a very successful company. And yet he, he worked with me so he could know what in the heck was going on on LinkedIn and how he could use it. Oh, I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I think because what you offer is kind of a helping hand. Mm -hmm. And because you mm -hmm. are one of them, um, it's probably received a lot better than some young person. Yeah, someone the other day said, I was so relieved when the teacher looked like you. <laughs> I wasn't expecting an older person. I think this was for some seminar um, I did for a trade organization. And I forget she was maybe 50, 60, whatever she was, but she was so cute because she was thinking they had some young whippersnapper kind of person teaching this LinkedIn class. So yeah, there's a lot of relatability that I have kind of, I say I'm like you're either your big sister or your mom depending on how old you are, of course. And then that annoying English teacher you thought you would never have to meet again, because that was my major. And I'll sit there and I'll say, no, nope, no, nope, you have a space. Nope. Do you know that word is spelled wrong even before Grammarly catches it? You know. So I just, um, I'm very picky about <laughs> punctuation and spelling and verbiage and all of that, yeah. Joyce, I wanna talk about power partners, okay? Mm -hmm. Power partners for our audience are those businesses who target your same ideal client, but are not your competition. 
One that I like to use as an example is a real estate agent and a mortgage broker. They both target that future homeowner, but they don't compete with one another. In fact, they wind up working together to benefit that client. And it's a great business relationship to build because you can give and receive referrals from that because those businesses understand who your client is. Mm -hmm. So with that, Joyce, who is Boomer Social Media Tutor's ideal client? So start with the ideal client and then go to the power partner. Yes. Is that the best way to go? It makes sense. Okay. Yes. yes. Well, my ideal client is somebody who is over 50. Actually, lately it's been over 60, but I kind of like the 50 something because they're quicker on the computer. But, I, I, but I'm happy to work with a 60 something. They're often women. I would say about 70, 30 um, percent, 70 percent women to 30 percent men. But I've been working especially lately with a lot of men. And they either have their own business, are doing it, I'll say, either solopreneur like I am or with a small office like you and Sam have, you know, so there's this, but it's not a big corporation. Um, I would actually like to do more, let's say, team training, you know, like say commercial real estate, speaking of real estate with, you know, eight to 10 group people on a team. That would be another ideal client for me uh, because I like to work with groups as well as individuals. Another segment that I work with are job seekers. Again, these are often the more mature age job seeker, but not I've helped job seekers just out of college, parents paying for the session sometimes. So that would be uh, that would be another type of person who I help who is an ideal client for me. So I'm thinking with those ideal clients in mind, um, you have both on the business side and you have the individual side. So on the right. business side, I'm thinking companies like staffing companies. Usually, mm -hmm. I'm guessing when you come in to a business to do pres a presentation or training or something, it's a business that has employees because that's who you're getting in front mm -hmm. of. And so I'm thinking staffing companies. Um, and then on the individual side, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned career people who are either changing careers or looking for a job. So I'm thinking those career coaches. Yeah, career coaches, mm -hmm. really good. And also I was looking back on my own records of how I got my clients over the last year, year or so. And business coaches are the most common people who refer me to uh, their clients who has come up in the conversation with their business coach that the client really does need some help on LinkedIn. And those are the people that are easiest for me to essentially convert into clients. I was going to close as more of a sales jargon, but to convert from a prospect to a client because they really trust that business coach or they wouldn't be engaging their services. So they say, oh, well, if Mary says I should use you, they come in prepared, really, when do I sign up type of thing. And I should also stress that the business owners that I help typically have a service type of business as opposed to some retail operation or e-commerce site. So these are providing some type of a service. I have a brand new client who is an image expert, fascinating person, has worked a lot with the dental industry, but she's, she now helps people in a variety of ways having to do with image and self-confidence. So, and even Toastmasters, where I've been in for a long time, I've gotten a lot of referrals to them. Um, they're essentially a type of power partner, if you will, because they're all about communication and leadership. And they are many times very active on like LinkedIn and Facebook, and they totally get what I do so they can explain it well. I'd say my biggest frustration in, is when I don't make it clear to the people that I want to serve people in the workforce or have their own business, because sometimes people say, well, I can set you up at such and such you know, senior living community. I think they want to know Facebook 101. <laughs> Well, I have done that kind of as a favor, but I am not interested in hanging out with a bunch of retired people, even though I myself am 72 years old and some might call me retired, but I am not. I'm rewired, as the book says, into my business. So I just like to, maybe because I got, I'm on the older end of the boomerang the age group. So that's part of it too. But I don't want to hang out with a bunch of, you know, old people. Let's just say that, even though I am one. <laughs> 
I like kind of how you said that I'm, I'm not retired, I'm rewired. <laughs> you should use that as your tagline. Um, <laughs> so Joyce, let's speak to that person who's watching the show and saying, I'm out in the workforce for the first time in many years. I don't know what I'm doing on LinkedIn or on social media where I need to find a job or I need to learn how to use social media a little more effectively to change that career, find that company that's hiring. What's the best way for that person to reach out to you? Oh, the best way for that person to reach out to me and to get help with LinkedIn or maybe to some extent Facebook, they go to my website. So I'll slow down a little bit here. Boomers, B-O-O-M-E-R-S, social media, tutor, T-U-T-O-R dot com. So boomers as in for baby boomers, boomers, social media, tutor dot com. And there they can read about my services. They can see videos of me. They can sign up for my ebook, which is free, which is really a good kind of a DIY approach if people like it, like, oh, look, I can do a lot on my own. And then also they can uh, sign up for my newsletter too. So that's really the clearinghouse for me. It would be my website. Okay. Any last thoughts for our audience? Well, something we were talking about at the break, so to speak, was the whole thing of the LinkedIn about section. That's something, is that right, Gina? Did we get yes. into that after we had that kind of, okay. So I want to tell you just briefly about what happened to me here. I've been on LinkedIn for a long time. I have like 9,000 followers. I thought I was doing pretty well, but I thought, you know, I could always get some additional help. So I got my own LinkedIn coach. Yes, I did. And so Clarine, that's her name out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Clarine Mitchell is a force of nature. And when she speaks, you listen and you do what she says, because she's a uh, high D to use a disc, you know, example that that one personality type. So anyway, she says to me, Joyce, I think you should throw out your current about section. And I go, really, Clarine? She says, yes, you should tell your story. It is such a powerful story. But all those years, you didn't really find a calling. And finally, at 61 years old, you found this calling to be a social media trainer and tutor, especially in LinkedIn and Facebook. So I did, I start writing free form, right with her looking over my shoulder, sort of virtually like right this. And I just wrote and wrote. I mean, actually at one point I mean, the tears are coming down my face. I'm not kidding you because I wanted to be a teacher so much and it didn't work out. So I told her and it made me very vulnerable, very relatable, very accessible. So that was her point is that your that about section is a part of your LinkedIn. We can really tell your story and kind of and keep it within the realms of propriety, and yet still tell your truth about yourself. Because elsewhere in your experience section, if you're featured, there's so many other places to give just the facts, ma'am, part of it. But this is kind of really the heart of your LinkedIn profile, the about section. So quick note of advice, audience, take a look at your about you section on LinkedIn. And if you don't even have a LinkedIn account, stop what you're doing right now. You can press pause on this video, <laughs> go out to LinkedIn, set up an account, and then contact Joyce, and she can help you the rest of the way through. Perfect. Joyce, thank you so much for coming on my show today. I love catching up with you. You're one of my favorite people, and I really appreciate you. Well, thanks. It was such a pleasure. I really had fun with this, and I love the concept of your show. So it was an honor and a blessing. Thank you, Gina. You're welcome. Thank you, audience, for watching this episode. We could not do your virtual coffee without you. Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. At Your Virtual Coffee, we love business professionals. So business people, let's talk. Have a great day. Your Virtual Coffee is sponsored by Ventola Law. Ventola Law, mediation and legal representation at an expert level. You can find them at VintolaLaw.com. Thanks for joining me today. For more information on your virtual coffee, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wait for it, our website at YourVirtualCoffee.com. Thanks again for watching and have an incredible day.